A priest is an authorized person to perform the sacred rites of a religion, especially as a mediator between human and God. The hive's religion is war, a conquest to rid the universe of all imperfections, to whittle the universe towards its final perfect form. The sacred rite is the sword logic, killing that proves you are part of the final universe. Oryx's war priest demands that we demonstrate our knowledge of the hive rituals, our ability to kill, and if deemed worthy, he will act as a priest, a mediator between guardians and a god, providing passage to the Taken King. Welcome back, guardians. Today we are discussing the law surrounding the war priest in the King's Fall raid. I will use Grimoire cards, raid mechanics, and also information from Bungie's King's Fall right along to explore this topic. Be sure to stay to the end of the video or skip to the end of the video, the link is in the description, as I have the fourth and final Destiny artwork sketch for this month, which depicts Razil Azir. Also be sure to vote on your favourite sketch using the poll card in the top right hand corner of this video, or you can go over to Twitter and vote twice. The sketch that receives the most votes will be completed in colour and in greater detail. You can support the artwork and also download the images through my Patreon account. The link is also in the description. This is Mylan Games and I hope you enjoy this latest Destiny Law video. Let's begin with the three main Grimmel cards that refer to the War Priest. The War Priest Grimmel card, verse 4.0, a golden amputation from the Book of Sorrows, and also the King's Fall Grimmel card. The War Priest Grimmel card confirms that the War Priest has ascended to his position due to his many victories in battle and as a faithful servant of Oryx. It reads The principle put upon his brow was slaughter, constant and escalating. The principle he put behind his eyes was victory, which is the last true shape. The principle he put into his hands was tribute to Oryx, king of taking. And the card ends with, challenge me by the law of my ascendance. From this, it appears that the war priest has earned his position amongst the ascendant hive through many victories in battle. The War Priest Grimoire card also mentions that he was present from the Golden Amputation to the Gift Mast. These are distinct events that occurred during the Book of Sorrows, which we know happened thousands of years prior to the appearance of Guardians. So we can also assume that the War Priest has been victorious for thousands of years fighting faithfully at Oryx's side. The Book of Sorrows, verse 4.0, A Golden Amputation, provides further detail about the War Priest's involvement during this earlier time, specifically during the Golden Amputation. The Golden Amputation refers to Oryx's war against a race known as the Taishi Bethi, who were eventually made extinct by Oryx. The War Priest had a significant role in this, and the Golden Amputation Grimoire card reads, in his throne world, Oryx paces ten times. On the third pace, Oryx's war priest meets them in battle, and he is victorious. He paints the void with fire, he salts the earth with ash. The war priest is very important to Oryx, not only for his strength in battle, acting like a general of sorts, but also his ability to pay tribute to Oryx through slaughtering his enemies. The war priest Grimoire card reads, the principle we put into his hands was tribute to Oryx, king of taking, tithing to his lord that the first navigator might escape the need to kill for substance, the worm need, that he might use his power to lead the final work. The war priest aims to do enough killing that would provide enough tribute to satisfy the hunger of Oryx's worm, and in doing so this would free Oryx to continue his work. I have heard other theories that the War Priest is not just feeding tribute to Oryx, but also trying to discover a way to release Oryx of his worm. I don't think this is the case, and I believe that the War Priest Grimoire card is just emphasizing the importance of the War Priest in Oryx's lines of tribute. 
On a side note, the War Priest card also hints that time passes differently in Oryx's throne world. It describes how with every step of Oryx, every second passing in his throne world, an obvious greater amount of time is passing in reality, as with every step, major battles and events, which would surely take hours, days, maybe even years, are occurring in reality. This idea that time passes differently in Oryx's throne world is also reinforced by verse 4.9, open your eye, go into it, in the Book of Sorrows. In this verse, Crota is fighting the Vex for, quote, a hundred years of local time. The use of the words local time indicating that there are time differences between the throne world and reality. Returning back to the information about the War Priest, we can conclude that the War Priest has been fighting at Oryx's side for thousands of years and has been a faithful servant, tithing his slaughter to Oryx in order to feed his worm. Whilst I believe this was the War Priest's major role for some time, I do believe that the War Priest was also given a greater honour amongst the Ascendant Hive, and that is to actually act as a priest. A human priest is a mediator between humans and God, so the war priest's role is to connect us to one of the hive gods, in this case, Oryx. However, he is only to provide this passage if and only if we are competent in the way of the hive, in the sword logic. This is reinforced by the King's Fall Grimoire card that reads, I was right. At first, in the ever-expanding blighted place, even light must obey the sword logic. Even you guardians, you best and brightest of the dying dawn, you drew blood in honour of the taken king. The war priest did his duty and you did yours. The war priest's duty was not to stop guardians from facing Oryx, but was to provide passage and connect guardians with Oryx, if they demonstrated sword logic if they could match the war priest in bloodshed, if they could prove that they were part of the final universe. Whilst the war priest is only ever described as a faithful servant of Oryx, there is a hint that he is not necessarily faithful to Oryx, but he is faithful to the worm gods and or the deep. When you defeat the war priest on challenge mode, you receive the emblem Worm God Servant. This reinforces that the War Priest serves the Worm Gods, not necessarily Oryx, and he upholds the philosophy of the Deep, i.e. to make the final perfect form of the universe. Therefore, if someone shows the potential strength to beat Oryx, his duty is to provide passage and allow them to challenge. This concept was actually reinforced during the Bungie's King's Fall ride-along, Jill Shah, a member of Bungie's writing team, explained how Oryx's door would always be open to be challenged. She linked this idea to her background in medieval studies where knights would leave a shield outside of their tents and another knight could challenge them by banging on the shield. Similarly, Oryx allows us to challenge him once we have proven we are worthy. Now that we understand the general purpose of the War Priest, we can look more closely at the language used in the raid itself, the activity feed, the naming of areas, and the general mechanics. The ride along confirmed that certain areas of the raid were also named using a medieval theme. As we enter the first section of the War Priest battle, you will notice it is called Basilica. Basilica has a number of different meanings, one is a medieval church, which reinforces the role of the war priest, i.e. to provide passage to challenge Oryx, and the other is an ancient Roman law court or a place for public assemblies. The idea that this area is a church and also a courtroom is perfectly suited, because we are being trialled by the war priest to prove our worth before we are given an audience with a god, i.e. Oryx. As we enter the Basilica, we must first face the Annihilated Totem's encounter. Before beginning the encounter, we can see acolytes kneeling in worship with weapons floating above their head. I have long thought this may be how the Hive tithe energy from killing to those above them. Their weapons are charged with death, and they offer it to the superior Hive. 
This is just speculation, however considering this is both a church and a courtroom, it makes sense that the inferior hive are also trying to prove their worth in front of the war priest with the hope of ascension. As you will know, this area contains two annihilator totems, one to the left of the door and one to the right of the door. You likely also know that these totems were created in the Book of Sorrows by Oryx's daughters, Ir Halak and Ir Anuk, the Death Singers. The two sisters created the annihilated totems in order to combat the Vex, when Croda accidentally allowed the Vex into Oryx's throne world. Luckily, Guardians have had previous experience with annihilated totems from Croda's end raid, and they know that standing directly beneath a totem disarms it. However, unfortunately, it appears that the Death Singers have added a mechanism to stop Guardians from deactivating the totems so easily. If you attempt to stand in the area with the totems without an aura, you will be killed. In the area to the left, your death screen will say that you were killed by Presence of Ir Anuk, using the weapon Blight of Weaving. If you stand in the area to the right without an aura, you will be killed by the presence of Ir Halak, using the weapon Blight of Unraveling. Despite the cunningness of the Death Singers, for some reason they left behind their brands. The brand of the Unraveler and the brand of the Weaver, which grants an aura of protection from this annihilated totem security defense. In the ride along, Jill Shah confirmed that the mechanics in this area was meant to foreshadow the Daughters of Oryx being later seen in the raid. In addition, she said that the purpose of the Daughters was to unravel our reality and weave into it Oryx's throne world. This is why we must use the brand of the Unraveler in the area with the Blight of the Weaving, and why we must use the brand of the Weaver in the area with the Blight of the Unraveling. We use the auras to survive by unraveling and weaving reality simultaneously. For reasons unknown to us, when we do this, Guardians are gifted with the Death Singer's power. Maybe we have tricked the Annihilator Totems into thinking we are Death Singers. Regardless, the power acts as a key, and after continuously feeding this power into the Hive Glyphs, we are deemed worthy and giving access to the War Priest. As we enter the main encounter, we are presented with three large statues. One side is embedded with glowing Hive Glyphs, and the other depicts what I can only assume is Ascendant Hive. You'll notice that these statues have the same appearance as the Nocris and Crota statues that can be seen aboard the Dreadnought. Raid designer Brendan Thorne refers to them as monoliths, and this is confirmed by the activity feed which reads, The War Priest draws power from a monolith, and that happens after he activates the Oculus and the monolith disappears. However, if you break the glyph sequence too often, your death screen will say that you have been killed by a worm stone idol, with the weapon line reading, Initiate Rejected. From a lore point of view, I'm not too sure whether we can explain all of these mechanics, and I think sometimes that not all mechanics need to be explicitly linked to lore. The most we can say though is that these monoliths or worm stone idols contain some sort of power, as the War Priest draws from it as the fight progresses. Why the monoliths show us the glyph sequence, and why they protect us from the Oculus when the War Priest calls upon it, I don't know. However, the term Initiate Rejected reinforces the overarching concept of the War Priest. We are being trialled to prove our worth before being connected to Oryx, before being allowed to challenge Oryx. That being said, one mechanic that was given more attention in the Bungie Ride Along was the brand of the Initiate. After correctly inputting the glyph sequence, one Guardian is given the brand of the Initiate, allowing the team to do damage to the War Priest. However, within the development team, this mechanic was initially called something else. It was called Drowned in Blood. Apparently because one of the developers was a Slayer fan. Even though it may have been named after a dev's favourite band, the name also emphasises that we need to match the War Priest in Bloodshed, and thus the aura can be extended by killing the surrounding acolytes. 
I assume that the War Priest Grimmel card subtly references the original name of the brand by saying, match me in bloodshed, or in blood be drowned. Which is pretty cool as they've kept an aspect of the initial concept still in the Grimmel cards. Lastly, we should speak about the Oculus. In game, the giant orb above the War Priest's head is only ever referred to as the Oculus. However, in the War Priest Grimmel card, it references that the War Priest learnt how to make an Oversoul. During the ride along, Brennan Thorne also references the Oculus as an Oversoul. Whilst the War Priest Grimmel card suggests that the War Priest learnt this technique of making an Oversoul from Crota, Crota was not the one to invent the Oversoul. Once again, the daughters of Oryx were involved with this creation. In verse 4.8, the Petition of Death, Ihalak and Iranuk describe how they invented a method to remove their soul in order for them to be more difficult to kill. Crota obviously learnt this method from his sisters, creating the Oversoul we see in Crota's end raid. And consequently, the War Priest learnt this from Crota, and now we see it in the King's Fall raid. Interestingly, when we kill the War Priest, a portal opens providing passage for Guardians so they can proceed to challenging Oryx. However, the Oversoul remains. So the question is, is the War Priest really dead? Or will he rise again and continue to fulfill his duty, testing any potential challenges to the throne? In fact, this role may be even more important with the throne currently vacant. Before moving on to the artwork, I will quickly mention that the War Priest also provides a component for Touch of Malice called Blade of Famine. Check out my Touch of Malice video for more information about that. Let me now introduce the fourth and final piece of artwork for this month, and then I'll recap the other art pieces so that you can vote for your favourite artwork. Whichever piece of art receives the most votes will be completed in colour and in greater detail. Here is the fourth and final piece, Razil Azir, the First Guardian. If you saw my last video, you will know this scene. Razil has just had his ghost revive him whilst in the grasps of a kel. Razil shoots the kel dead, and then as the other fallen close in, Razil Azir punches the dead kel with the Titan Striker Fist of Havoc. I will now recap the other art pieces. The first is Touch of Malice, representing how Oryx lives on through Guardians. If voted for, the final edit will show the Guardian holding Touch of Malice. The second is Golgoroth, the Orb Weaver, which is mixed with some fan fiction, with Golgoroth spinning a Guardian into a cocoon on his back. The third is Zer, uh, you must stop eating salted popcorn. If you'd like to support myself and the artists who make these creations, feel free to visit my Patreon account to donate, and as a reward, you'll also be able to download these images. Otherwise, if you just want to support the channel with a comment, you can leave the phrase, Drowned in Blood, an acknowledgement of the original name of the brand of the initiate. Once again, it has been a pleasure. This is Mullen Games. Peace.